We've got a very special guest today, uh, Lara Tom. She's a dynamic force of nature. She's the CMO for Guzman Gomez. I'm very appreciative because we got the call on Friday that the two people in this session couldn't make it. Um, so I rang her up and I said, go onto the website. She did. She saw this massive set. It was colourful, expensive, huge room. Sorry, Lara. <laughs> I marketed the shit out of you. Um, so we've got a smaller room. It's not quite the the main theatre that I uh, gave you the impression for. But uh, a little bit later, we'll walk through one of the most innovative marketing teams uh, that I've seen. Let us begin. So um, for those who don't know, my name is Jules. Uh, I, um, I have a vision. It's like having a dream, but it's far more superficial than Martin Luther King's. It's about selling shit. Um, but I believe that the world's advertising creative can be generated by the very consumers it's designed to engage. So all the picks and clips, well not all of them, but the majority of picks and clips um, that we use in everything from social advertising to billboards can be generated by everyday consumers, in fact your customers. And I'll give you a bit of an idea of how I was led to this obsession. But first, what do you think is holding this back as of today? Why do you think already that the world's advertising creative isn't generated by everyday people? Yep. Yep. Beautiful. God, that's the best I've heard yet. We'll just stop there. See ya. <laughs> Someone else? Quality. Great. Yep. So it could be crap. Yep. Someone else? Control. Control. All right, so nerves for a brand to hand over their keys and does that expose you to brand safety issues? Good one. Anyone else? I mean, how do you manage all the assets? Could be another one. Do the consumers even want to participate? So what led me to this, um, this view just is... I worked in TV for 10 years as a reporter and then I moved into radio. And when I moved into uh, radio, all my w ideas were visual. But the, um, the problem with radio is that they can't see you. And so, I learnt that the hard way, um, when the producer said, your ideas don't work here. Um, but I, uh, I then invested all my creative OCD in the social media platform. So this is about five or six years ago when no one really cared in radio about socials. Um, I then uh, realised very quickly that there was something unique there from a storytelling point of view. So I'd done visual communication um, in uni, then I'd obviously told stories on TV and, and radio, etc. But what I realised in social was it's, it's not you broadcasting, it's, it's a conversation and your audience talks back. And I, I found that there was this un, un, incredible depth of relationship and intimacy that you could actually form with your consumers. I managed to build the most engaged Facebook brand page in the country. And then at that point, um, a lot of the brands and media agencies were asking um, Southern Cross Austeria, how did we build that asset? Um, they said, Jules, I started to consult on uh, how to engage social tribes. From that, uh, influencer marketing started to garner a bit of attention and they knew that I did social content. So there was about 18 months where I was inundated with social um, sponsored post requests, but it was absolutely horrific. So Nike, for instance, if they wanted me to jump in the air um, wearing some sneakers in slow-mo, uh, Nike would go to the media agency, who'd go to our sales team, would go to our radio producers, to my talent agent, and then my talent agent would say, they want this URL in their sponsored post. And I'd say, you can't put web links in sponsored posts, and it'll go all the way back down this chain. And so it would take months to sell one piece of content. And so what I did was I just designed um, a workflow solution for that. But I saw influencer marketing very different um, to others because uh, at that point, um, that Facebook brand page, the organic reach started to just plummet. Do you remember when they changed edge rank about five years ago? And obviously in the last 18 months, the same's happened with Instagram. And so I wasn't reaching my audience and I learned something very quickly, which was I'd been building this amazing community on someone else's land and they just changed the locks. So I knew that if I was building an influencer platform, that the influencers themselves wouldn't own that audience and I would never own my audience as well. 
So I knew we could provide the poetry, but Facebook would always be best to provide the plumbing. And so what I did is rather than build uh, a platform on the reach you get from influencers, we built it on the content you get from influencers. So in our platform, rather than brands or agencies going and picking out a group of content creators um, and then uh, going through this long protracted process of content delivery, and then if the content's not right, you've already negotiated with them, so you get in these revision loops, we asked our brands to post a brief for free and then the content creators go out and purchase the product if they don't already own it. Because we said if you don't own it or you're not willing to buy it, you actually have no right to recommend that your tribe should. And so they would go out and they would craft the content with no guarantee of getting paid exactly to that brief and they would pitch it. So it was content up front. And then if the brands like it, they buy it. If they don't, they don't. And something really odd started to happen over the last 12 to 18 months. So if, for instance, Nutella was to go to an influencer model and they were saying, uh, a platform that is, um, not someone who promotes teeth whitening and spray tans, walking around with a cavoodle and a white Land Rover. Um, but they would, uh, they would go, I need 50 pieces of content. They'd go to 50 influencers and generate 50 pieces of content. In our platform, you were choosing the top 50 out of 150 submissions. And so the brands were going, I've just run the influencer campaign. That was really good, 50 pieces, they're all live. But they started to ask about the other 100 pieces that they declined um, that aren't being used. And they said, I declined that influencer because their engagement wasn't great, or their price wasn't good, or I didn't like the caption, or I clicked through to their feed and that is not the sort of uh, conversation I want my brand to be a part of. But they said, that piece of content, the creative, is amazing. Like, I want to use that in my blogs or EDMs or social advertising. So what we had inadvertently done was create this stock image library, but on demand, where you post a brief and your own customers go out there, purchase it and submit it. So for instance, Land Rover put a brief in and within you know, a week they get 200 pieces of content. Right? But it actually features the brand, and if they say, I don't want it, they can say, I'll decline it. And the content is really rich and different. So this came in within a couple of hours. Someone just goes, I've got a Land Rover. Uh, I'm going to go out there and, and do some drone work because it's a sunny day. So there's speed within it as well. So we built our model to help brands turn their customers into their marketing department, but they're now sort of turning them into their creative department. And so we realised we, we started to solve an even bigger problem. And that's not to say that, you know, for instance, we're moving away from influencer marketing because, you know, that has only just began as a category. It's had a lot of hang-ups about measurement, about fake um, followers and engagement. All that stuff's about to be cleaned up and, you know, for the first time it'll be able to come out of the, the shadows as a legitimate channel. But there's this other piece which is just literally using your customers to drive your creative let me unpack that bigger problem that I was discussing. So the digital ad landscape has seen 10 years of investment into massive distribution networks to the point where I can place an ad into one of these networks targeting you with a product I know you want at a time I know you want to buy it. And those solutions get more sophisticated by the day. So the distribution of ads is no longer the problem. Generating the ads is still a point of friction. As you can imagine, it was only a few years ago that most brands could get away with a TVC and a handful of still images for a print campaign or billboard that would last them a year to now needing that every week or two in, in digital advertising. And so what's happening at the moment in social advertising, as we know, last year, and it's increasingly happening, happening, brands aren't able to put branded content within the social feed organically and get any cut through, right? So 12 months ago, you could almost get enough to the point where if you then had a crap piece of creative and you put 20 bucks behind it, you were guaranteed to get eyeballs. But the problem is now that everyone's being taken out of the organic feed, there's going to be a flocking of uh brands needing to buy social advertising. Now, do you really think that those social platforms are going to increase the volume of advertising in the feed? They're not. 
because they have to keep the users happy. And don't forget, the reason they're taking brands out of there is because they're saying that they want to um, uh, increase the meaningful relationships between you and your family and friends. They're not just going to load it with all the brands who want to pay. So they're not going to increase the volume. They're going to increase the price. And it's already started to happen. And to be honest, I think social advertising has been grossly underpriced anyway. So it's inevitable. Which means if you're going to be paying for content and now that this is the competitive landscape, they're not comparing paid with unpaid, it's just all paid, the ones that cut through are those that nail the creative, right? That's what's going to perform, not just putting money behind it. Now, if you want to nail the creative in this day and age, there's three areas that you have to master. The first is variety, volume, and then creative formats. So let's just unpack those. Variety. So TV, radio, print, outdoor, that is mass marketing. Facebook and Google, for instance, are not. They are the most sophisticated direct marketing operations in history. And their superpower is being able to target precise audiences with precise messaging. Now, we are uh, a content company, and we struggle with having enough creative to appeal to all our different um, personas. Who are you guys? Marketers, for the most part. So I could have this ad and it'll work for fashion, uh, fashion marketers, but then I need to obviously replicate that for marketers that work in the food industry, sports, travel, and beauty and personal care. Now I could nail that ad set, but that's only speaking to business owners, perhaps. Then I need to replicate that so I can tailor it to marketers that work in agencies or marketers that work within global brands. So. Personalization, as we know, and this is what this whole couple of days is about, I feel that that's the running theme, is the key to conversion, if we accept that. But variety is useless without a constant supply. You need volume, because even if I nail that ad set, I can't leave it there for six months. It'll go stale. It suffers from ad fatigue. And then that is really just still imagery that I'm talking about. Then if I'm using different channels, I might need vertical video, I might need six second ads, I might need long form, uh, I might need carousels. So you start to realise the difficulty and you can't just grab content and put it in the wrong format. You can't grab a, you know, a, a, a catalogue ad or billboard ad and ram it in Instagram like we were able to get away with in the early days because now your consumers literally just block it. Or worse yet, they don't and you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on content that just completely gets ignored. Now, we understand that it's difficult, and for most advertisers, we've been caught off guard. The shift has occurred quickly. We understood, we understand the value of multivariate testing in AdWords. So we knew the power of, you know, writing 100 text variations uh, in search and then seeing which 10% convert, and then our, our budget goes there and we continually optimize. So we understand that methodology that stretches across all advertising. Now, in a visual world of advertising, how do we craft 100 pieces of content that all could work, knowing that perhaps a good proportion of those are going to be left by the wayside for that particular strategy? How do we craft that? So for instance, you look at a, a fruit juice company. How do they start with 100 pieces of content? Now, never, never mind the multivariate testing, but how, knowing that it's a digital world and we need everything to appeal to different personas. Now, the existing creative solutions are really valuable, as we know. Creative agencies, amazing, right? But they're not set up um, for, well, they, they're set up for high quality, low volume production output, right? And not every brand can afford that, especially SMEs. And then obviously you've got stock image library, but it doesn't always feature your particular brand. And then you've got, um, you know, the great products Live Fire through Adobe, which sources content that lives online. But once again, it has to live online for you to source it first. So what is another solution in this day and age to be able to address this building pressure system? What I say is, is, is you guys, it's customers, customer generated content. Because they can craft the variety, the volume, instinctively, and they are the experts at crafting thumb-stopping content. Like we already know that UGC performs 6.9 times better in Facebook than brand-generated content. 
Why? Because who better to create content that customers love than customers themselves? And no one loves that authenticity more than the actual brands. But the reality is all we're really talking about here is UGC and it's boring because we've heard about that. We've always known about that UGC thing sitting on the side. But there's a difference now. There's two differences, in fact. The first one is that your users today are armed with this. So every smartphone manufacturer on the planet is currently racing each other and the war will be won by whoever releases the most advanced creative tools. You look at their marketing now. They stopped talking about their phone years ago. It's all about the camera. It can be super slow-mo, AR, stop motion. It just goes on and on, portrait mode. All of them reimagined, the camera reimagined, I think is the latest slogan from Samsung. And that's, that's all the way through from Pixel, Huawei, Samsung, iPhone. So those users now have the tech, and they have the talent. A billion everyday people have now graduated from the University of Instagram. They have spent seven years crafting their own personal brands online, and they now think like marketers. It's incredible when I see content that comes through that is responding to a brief, and they get the color tones. The same color tones in the packaging, and they use it in flowers and arrangements. I look in the brief, and I go, surely someone said use bits of orange and black, and they haven't. It's just an incredible mindset. Something has shifted there. About, you know, it was only a few years ago where personal branding was weird, but just even the thought of branding, where everyday people think like marketers. So they have the tech and they have the talent, but that doesn't mean they actually want to become marketers or even generate content for marketers. So do they? Well, I'm happy to report yes. You know, through our tests, and when I say tests, I just mean running a business and trying not to go under because my house is on the line. Um, you know, 1,200 is the number that, the number of branded pieces of content that get submitted on a good day within Tribe. So that's brands that have put their briefs in there get 1,200. So one every 1 1.25 minutes. 400,000 pieces of content celebrating brands they already use and love over the last three years. If you were to print each and every one of those and lay it out, it'd be f***ing long. But you would never have any reason to do that, so stop wasting paper. And then 50 to 100 pieces of content submitted in a typical campaign in the first week. And as I said, it's fast. So your customers are now responsive and they love generating beautiful content. So that was just an example we presented in London to Unilever's team. They said, it's Halloween on Sunday. It's now Wednesday. I need some content. They put the brief in there and they are able to run it, you know, where people go out and purchase that. And I think the biggest breakthrough is not that you can now pay people to generate that content, like crowdsource it. I actually think the greatest evolution is being able to ask them. And it's blindingly simple. So as an example, you put up a brief, uh, inviting your own customers to craft a pick or a clip, celebrating whatever you want them to. And it doesn't have to be holding a product. It can be absolutely anything, long-form video, etc. The content creators will then get that brief in their app. They go out there. If they don't own it, they buy it. And, but admittedly, if it's pre-release or um, it's not easy for, you, you know, it's not at the local store, then you can send them samples or give them a code so they can go through your funnel on your website and purchase it, then what they do is they submit it to you. So this is your inbox where you start to get all of this content that comes through. Keeping in mind at this point you haven't paid a cent. Literally you've spent five or ten minutes putting a brief in there with the, some mood board imagery. Um, it's like having a hundred photographers come to your wedding but you only purchase the pics that you love. And then if you like it, the influencer publishes it to their feed at the highest engagement. Or if you're doing just a content campaign, um, they never publish it. They just produce it for you and then you use it in your own advertising. Now, we knew that people were using this in advertising. We knew that they're using it in social because you can share it on your own channels for free. But then we started seeing them obviously use it in paid ad campaigns, um, applying uh, graphics over it and making it a more dynamic ad format than just a still image, which doesn't take much. Print campaigns, um, webs, and it's self-serve. So, you know, like for a, a local pizzeria, which this was, 
you know, they literally had their customers from around the area that knew of it come in, buy pizza, take some photos, and those guys were able to use it on menus and websites, etc. Ebooks, it's not just imagery, they were able to actually take the recipe that they used as well to turn it into some beautiful content marketing. There's a stunning scarf, which you'll all get in your goodie bags. You don't have goodie bags. Point of sale, uh, and even out of home. And this, this is the pieces that excites me because you start to realise, hang on a sec, I thought that was social influencers. I thought this is social content creators. And you start to realise it transcends social media. So Bacardi ran a national billboard campaign over thousands of locations across Australia using dozens of pieces of content from their own customers. For them, you know, it was a half million dollar spend in media. They might have usually put 100K of creative in that and taken a little while. They spend 14K and it takes two weeks. So they're obviously saving 80% on their um, creative, which can either go back into the media spend to actually drive performance even better. But for the creator, they're literally out at a bar looking at a brief going, I love Bacardi, I'll do the next round and we'll get paid $150. It's not just still imagery, as I said. So these are boomerangs, as an example. Um, cinemagraphs, which is a great fusion of um, static and motion. Um, there's great apps for that. Stop motion, which is now a setting within your iPhone. Um, and once again, these guys, when bought a 35-pound bottle of Moet, you know, they can be declined, literally. So you'd want to like the Moet because at the end of the day, you've spent an hour. And that actually, that bakes in the authenticity, which I personally like. And then carousels, which work really well for a path of purchase path to purchase. I thought this was done really well. It's just a simple way for her community to love it. And then obviously Insta stories are exploding as well. So vertical video, it's incredibly versatile, not only getting vertical video, but then obviously you can put it into display. You can take it all the way through um, to uh, out of home as well. Long form video content. There's not oodles and oodles of this, but there's great platforms like Janeiro um, that do a lot of video content. Um, who are doing really well out of Melbourne. Um, and it just starts to get a bit wacky every now and then. You know, it's a bit like uh, this is a mustard brand just going, what is, someone's just put 120 pound on this. I can literally just purchase this and it goes live. Just so happens that a husband, I think, is a creative director. And then... It has to. But I'm not saying there's like, you can get thousands of that. I wouldn't bullshit you. Um, and then there's all this great unique art. You know, you d as I say, it doesn't have to be holding up products. Like, for instance, Marvel, they're worried, hang on, is people going to take a photo in this really dark room um, at a cinema? And, you know, they create uh, lollipops, latte art, illustrations, cookies. Someone killed their cat and stuffed it. Lego art, this was for Facebook Messenger that used um, their, their own customers, time lapse. So once again, think of your campaign strategy. What does it look like plus time lapse, plus slow-mo, you know, to start to think broadly around those opportunities. And if you just add your strategy with that, illustration, what does your product look like when it's illustrated? Um, this is a combination of stop motion and illustration. This is one for Lara, uh, Guzman and Gomez, which was uh, a Day of the Dead campaign. Um, and then there's all sorts of formats that will only continue to grow, like witchcraft. I think that's After Effects, which is like witchcraft to me anyway, because I can't learn it. And then drone footage. Once again, what does your product or strategy look like with drone? And then this is a really interesting one that I just threw in this morning. This is still impending, so it hasn't actually been purchased. But it's AR. I don't know how they did it. But there's all these great AR apps out there at the moment that... And I would think that there's every... Um, there's every... Um, a developer on the planet now with AR kit trying to develop great apps that can unlock... Uh, consumer AR for brands and so there'll be a lot of explosion like we talked to Bacardi, uh, Bacardi about that they've got a bat within their um, logo to be able to go down to a bottle and it come alive I think you did you see the um, 
the 19 criminals or what is it, the convicts one? Have you seen that? Where it's basically a bottle of wine and you put up your phone and the guy on the wine, which is like a criminal from you know the 1900s, starts telling you the story about the wine and it's mind-blowingly good. And so you start to – that's all great. You can invest a lot of money into AR and you get this app and then you put it out there like you used to with a hashtag and you're like, this hashtag's going to go viral and then nothing happens. So this is a way of doing all that work and then just kick-starting um, that virality. And then what you do is you've got endless campaign strategies that you can take one of those creative formats and add it. You know, for instance, calendar events. You know, you could do a whole year of just turning your customers. They're all experiencing the same thing, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas. If you loaded it up and got ahead, there's amazing celebrations within your vertical. And what's interesting is that this is not to say this undercuts creative agencies because in many ways it has to be on top of. You know, creative agencies will always do the award-winning content that goes to can. They will need to sit down and ideate. These content creators and your customers aren't coming up with these world-bending ideas that you can explode. They're going to reflect the narrative that you set, right? So there is limitations, I believe, in it, but they'll, they'll reflect it in their tone, which I think has some great authenticity to it. But um, a friend, Leo Raymond, um, who's the CEO of Grey Worldwide, actually not Grey Worldwide, Grey London, he'll like it that I said worldwide, he's just got a pay increase. Um, but he said, so should I be threatened? I'm like, not at all. I said, they're going to need everything. It's on top of, right? Uh, he said, yeah, it's sort of like jazz. Like creative agencies begin the beat and then everyday creators add their sound and then amplify the volume. And to be honest, no one has done that better over the last couple of years than our next guest, um, Lara, Tom, who is coming up on stage. Use the stairs. Grab a water. Hungover. She's incredibly hungover. Um, they raised $44 million yesterday, and uh, she spent half of it on the bar. Um, this was that example, because we were talking a little bit about... Do you want me up here now? Or yeah, am yeah, I I'd, just like... Hi. No, s sit up there right now. But I did realise I jumped the gun on a slide. This was an example yeah. of how you can amplify volume and um, then we'll come out and speak to Lara. So this was a, a... Churchill is an insurance company in the UK. So these guys create this amazing stuff where um, they have this stunt woman that jumps out of the car because it's going into a ditch. And the symbol is that it, it takes a leap of faith leaving your insurance company to go to a new one. Um, unfortunately, I went through three stunt women. Um, but then the brief was put out and this is what they wanted. They just wanted this compelling, strange, suspenseful um, campaign where everyone was just leaping through the social feed. So around that time, and obviously the caption was doing the heavy lifting and pointing towards Churchill Insurance, but you start to understand how you can, you know, build it through a, a creative idea and let that drive on. So, um, first and foremost, uh, Lara, um, sorry for dobbing you in for the hangover, but you would have done the same for me. Yeah, I would have. Um, so, were you always destined to be a marketer? Um, look, I think destiny plays a part of it. Um, all my siblings work in marketing. My mum is convinced she's raised a bunch of bullshit artists. <laughs> my brother runs marketing for Combank. My sister runs marketing for a big magazine company. My other brother works for a competitor, well, the Rock Bull Group. So, wow. we're all... Um, yeah. yeah, and I started as a journo and I actually realised that um, I couldn't make enough money and I knew I wanted five kids. So I was like, I had to find something where there was some bucks. Um, <laughs> and yeah, being a professional bullshit artist kind of worked. Perfect. I've ended up in truth and authenticity though. We went through you the have. bullshit stage. Um, I've been there. So um, can you give us a bit of a quick overview of Guzmani Gomez? Okay, for those of you, I mean, many of you would have heard of JYJ, but uh, Guzman & Gomez was started 12 years ago um, in Newtown. It that was our first restaurant and started by two guys called Stephen Marks and Robert Hazen. And they were actually New Yorkers. Stephen was a very successful um, hedge fund manager in New York, made a, you know, a lot of money, and, um, and Robert. And they both married Australians and they ended up back here and they were cra it's that whole gap in the market thing. They were craving a good Mexican feast and they realised that the food that they were eating, that Australians were eating, was quite inferior in terms of authenticity. So they started up JYJ um, and they, they rapidly expanded to about six restaurants quite quickly and, and like any good entrepreneur, Stephen could kind of 
um, he, he called it this morning the race to bankruptcy. <laughs> Um, because at that time, if you think about it, Australians only knew Old El Paso as um, authentic Mexicans, so everyone thought that black beans were olives, that yeah. all the Latinos working in our restaurants were Indians. They didn't get it. <laughs> they didn't get it. So, Struth. Yeah. So then um, – but the tide started to turn just before they started, like really, it, it was quite a, on a knife's edge. And then the founding fathers of McDonald's – the three guys that actually bought the McDonald's brand to Australia um, discovered GYG and they said to Stephen, this is magic. We've never been this excited since we started Maccas. They said, we want in. And have you thought about the franchise model? And we rapidly expanded from there. Um, so today we're 107 restaurants in Australia, six in Singapore, four in Japan. Just announced overnight that we've raised some money to go to the US. So Wow. Because um, they don't have Mexican over there. No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> It's interesting, as, as we say, though, it's amazing what a large population there will accept in terms of mediocrity. Yeah. And to be successful in Australia, you have to be phenomenal because yeah. we've got high cost of goods, high rent, yep. high wages. Yeah. It's hard to make money here. Yeah. So if you can make it in the States being sh- mediocre, yeah. we believe, and you have to believe in yourself like you yeah. do in your business, yeah. we have to believe that we can do it. Yeah. And he's a New Yorker taking the brand home, you know, it's, it yeah. kind of works. Um, it is interesting that you talk about, because a lot of VCs in America are always asking, you know, Canva, um, uh, what's the other one, the billion dollar one? Atlassian, um, Afterpay, what is it? What's coming out of Australia? Like, how is that working? 90 seconds. And it's the fact that you, over there, you could put an Ormorite right product in and start to get money back and you can get traction. Over here, you'll get nothing. Yeah. So you have to be so good just to get revenue and stay afloat. So it drives the quality. It and does. so then when you go into another market, you're yeah. actually at a, a, d- yeah. at a different you level. You have to be phenomenal. Right. So people don't just like GYG. They love it. How do you harness that brand love from a content point of view? Um, We take a very different approach to marketing. We're not a traditional marketing model at all. Um, 90% of our marketing strategy is content. We we have a saying at GYG where we document, we don't create. And we document that because we know what our brand is. We know – and I always say you can can tell the success of a brand or a brand's kind of ID when somebody comes to you with an idea and you go, no, we wouldn't do that. That's not how we behave. I think a lot, we've got people laughing going, mm-hmm, we know that one. So you need to be able to identify and have an identity within your brand. And, and we know exactly who we are, what we stand for, what our values are. And that makes it so easy to tell stories. And so what are your main channels then? So main channels are obviously social media um, in terms of content creation um, and Facebook, Instagram. Um, and, and we do try to blow up the media in terms of our storytelling and the way, the narrative behind it. So we do, there's zero stunt marketing at GYG. What does that mean? You, you actually used a drone to deliver a burrito. We did. <laughs> and we, that is a commercial model for us. Really? So we have partnered with um, Alphabet's Innovation Arm, X, and there is a real business case behind why we are delivering drones in Canberra today because we want to change wow. fast food and reinvent it as we know it. So it's not something that we went, oh, let's put a drone in the middle of a paddock and lower it down and take some video and then get the front page of news.com. Yeah. For us, that is actually, there's a commercial model behind what we do and there's commerci- like commercial models behind everything. God, the stoners are going to love that, aren't they? They are. <laughs> they are. Um, What I love about, I suppose, what I've seen around your customers and and that brand love and and the the propensity that they will create content is it also is internal. So this is an example of one of your staff members that I saw on your Facebook page. Is he, did he just do this off his own bat? Yeah, so our, uh, they're they're fanatical uh, uh, crew and the culture within our business is one where if we have brand love with our crew, they'll deliver you guys a phenomenal guest experience. So we really look after them. But they are our content creators as well. And a lot of these guys, a lot of our 
um, our crew are highly educated. Mm. You know, a lot of them are, are visitors from overseas that have come in for, with working visas and they've got like PhDs in engineering and stuff. So they help us with how to cut the avocados and stuff. But we've got <laughs> with a, a lot knife. of... <clears throat> no, I in guess. terms of like how do you get volume through? How yeah. do you actually... Where's a machine that we can de-seed them and... You know, these guys are smart. They're not, they're not just sitting in fast food kind of yeah. taking their money. They actually love the brand. And we've got a lot of graphic designers and artists and, and as you said, content creators who are influencers. Like my yeah. nanny's got 15,000 followers. What's and content? there's no nudes. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, but, you know, these kids have got their own brand and their yeah. own personal brand and they love our brand so much and we support them in that. So we republish their content when they – and at my own um, feed, I must get – I don't know, what is it, Therese? We get about 50, 60 pieces of content a day from our crew. That's, That's just from our crew. <laughs> I've created a monster, cause nobody wants to eat nachos no more They want fresh fries, it's much better Well if you want fries, this is what I'll give ya Make it a meal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner Go get her, or not, cause we deliver Uber or deliver, we wonder which is quicker I'ma deliver to you if a drone, a trendsetter Deliver to who, I don't know, but no better So it has to start though with good food, yeah? It's a chef <laughs> um, Yeah, it is, for us it's all about the food We start with the food so yeah. we don't lead by brand. The product is the key for us. Yeah. If, if the food is shit, no one's coming back. Yeah. End of. So, you know, clean, healthy, preservative, free, everything's cooked fresh. We've got no freezers apart from our fries. Like, and we truly believe in the product. And, and this is because the product's so good. This is what evolves out of it. Yeah. What's been your proudest campaign content-wise? <coughs> Pardon me. Um, for, for us as a marketing department and – as a business, I guess it was Bring Cal Home. Um, Bring Cal Home um, was a quite organic campaign. It started with a young traveller, young kid by the name of Cal Ryan, and he sent us an email, a, a message on our Facebook page, pretty much saying, um, I've been deprived, marginalised, I'm so disappointed in you, I've been travelling in London for the last six months and I've been deprived of a GYD burrito. I suggest that you guys fly me back from London where I'm travelling. This is what I hate about millennials. <laughs> so entitled. Yes. <laughs> I suggest you fly me back and, um, and I will have a burrito and then you can fly me back to London <laughs> where I will continue my travels. And I was scrolling our Facebook feed very late at night because all of us, we have a policy where 100% um, of our comments need to be replied to within 24 hours. I'm involved, our CEO is involved, everyone responds in our tone of voice. Wow. Um, and so I was on that night, I think, and it is 24-7. And I picked it up and I thought, what a cheeky little bugger. <laughs> it's not going to cost me much. So I think it was, I think we said, if you get a couple of thousand shares and 5,000 comments, we'll fly you home for the opening of our 100th restaurant in the Gold Coast in Burley. Um, and he, he got on the phones. What I didn't know... We've talked about this before. He actually used to work for Nova. <laughs> he Zing. came from a media family. And I had no contact with this kid, right? It was all – I wanted it to be legit. So we made sure we didn't contact him. I thought, he's cheeky. He can work it out. And I, I, what I didn't realise is he had every media contact in the country. So he used the phones, he got on the radio, he got his friends working the phones. There were that many shares. I was having friends from literally Townsville to Melbourne saying, I've just heard this kid on the radio, he wants us to share his post, are you really going to fly him home? And he did it. We gave him three and a half weeks um, and he did it in a little over 24 hours. <laughs> um, but it was beautiful and, and the story was quite poetic and the content that came from it was extraordinary um, because what we realised was his older brother was living in London as well, um, his brother Nate, and we started bringing bring Nate home as well. So his mates started a hashtag, so we were like, oh, fuck it, we've got to bring the brother as well. Uh, oh, always oh, sorry, really ugly brother. <laughs> Sorry, I you can have nachos, Nathan. Yeah, so we're like, Nate's got to come. And then the story got even better. They had a younger sister who has since started working for us, which is, even makes the whole story more beautiful. But their other brother um, oh, had just had a baby. 
And neither of the boys had met the little niece. So when we got to the airport, we had T-shirts and masks and a whole bunch. I mean, we took it to town. We blew it out of the water because Channel 7 came in. I mean, the whole thing, the the media, he was on the um, Daily Mail in the UK. He was on the radio in the UK. And this thing went kind of global, Um, you know, just through the nature of his love of our brand. Mm. But we were very fortunate that he was super media savvy as well. Like, you couldn't have cast a better kid. True, true. However, I believe that the lesson there is, first and foremost, product has to be good because it's it's built out of authenticity. If the product isn't good, he's saying he's not playing with you. The brand tone invites that. But it's your awareness, you yeah. know. It's as a CMO who can make those decisions. But even all the way down to be able to communicate when there is this PR gold that comes yeah. through, you've got to be ready to launch on it and then amplify it. Here's yeah. just a, you know, this is the moment. You've got to be he, fast. Yeah. Um, this is the moment where he found out he got the call. I can't believe that. I was just sitting there tired and hungry up to work and... And I was like, God, I could go over it. I've been talking about this for six months. Really? And I said it to my friends and, um, and so I just as a Snapchat and they were like, dude, you should just post it as a joke. And I was like, you know what, let's start a Bring Home Cow campaign. And they all took to it and oh, I can't um, believe the support of that too. The people sharing and people commenting. I had um, some friends, 15 friends stay up overnight sharing, commenting, hashtagging, sending it to groups, sending it to media outlets. <laughs> um, that was unreal. Mm-hmm. Oh, you legend, congratulations, we're bringing you home. Thank you. Ah, oh, this is the best day of my life. I bet you as soon as he got off the plane, his mum walked up there and shaved that moustache. Because I would have. Yeah, the moustache came And then off. the universe just sometimes looks after you, you know, from a yeah. content point of view. Yeah. So that had nothing to do with you guys whatsoever. We did not pay her. She wants to be part of our cult. Cool. Of course. Um, and, we, and we didn't. And this is those extraordinary moments that happen with our brand where Kimmy, um, I think the collective total number of people that she tweeted that out to was like a bazillion. It was extraordinary. That's the or technical. Like, yeah. yeah, the technical term. But it was 66 million, you know, Twitter followers and X yeah. million Instagram. And she just thought she was looking hot right with our logo right behind. <laughs> yeah. You ripper. Mm. So you were one of the very first ones innovative in terms of getting into the micro-influencer space and turning your customers into your creative department and your marketing department, et cetera. What's the opportunity there? For us, um, and like for, in full disclosure, I'm a massive fan of Tribe. We all like, I'm, I've been quite public about that. And the reason for me is we don't do things unless they work. And for GYG... Micro-influencers work. It actually sells more food. It's that simple. Um, and so if it works, we want to continue to do it. Mm. So in continuing with, and, and we're really fortunate that food is a trend right now, but as we've seen in your presentation, everything there looked on trend and cool mm. if done in the right context. So for us, we can invest in, in micro of influencer content um, and see results, immediate results up to, you know, between 10 and 20% lifts Mm. in sales Mm. um, as a result of a launch of a new product or the launch of, um, you know, a substitution. Like one day we we put something out and said we're going to substitute cheese for our Max Chimmy Mayo for vegans um, and got only a few micro-influencers in the vegan space to share that news And once again, next day, fundamentally shift the dial. Yeah. What I like particularly in, you know, we spoke with with Westpac the other day, used the Adobe suite and, you know, they absolutely love Adobe is is the benefit of them being able to drive that in. You know, one thing, a pilot that um, Lara and I worked on, which was like a, it was like a split test pilot, but the idea or the question that we asked was what's better than a never ending pipeline of content is actually knowing which pieces convert before you purchase the rights to them to put in your own advertising. And so what we did is we sort of started with a hundred of these images and this was very manual 
but we created 100 Instagram ads. And obviously, there's systems and doing this through Adobe or, uh, you know, the, the consumer models um, will, will start to become more advanced and, and accessible. But we just did it really rudimentary where Lara gave us their exact target audience, um, the call to action, which is the landing page, where they want to go, the caption, and then we put two and a half grand behind 100 ads. So it's almost exactly the same. The only variable is the image, the creative. And we did that for five days, 25 bucks per. And then we just ranked it on performance on that particular objective, which was click through. But what's fascinating in doing this was um, that Lara's team had already purchased some content. Um, and what we did was, and, and they'd purchased that content based on um, engagement or personal favorites or for specific strategies that doesn't necessarily fit within all broad yeah, I, think, I, I think a little of the third, really, because yeah. in terms of our brand story, um, a lot of those images that we purchased the content for told a story that we wanted to tell now and in the future. And so the engagement piece, um, obviously there are a few that we needed from an engagement um, point of view, but the story that we want to tell is sometimes coupled with other things in the background. Yeah, yeah. but it just goes to show, because this was the content that they'd previously chosen and bought sitting for this particular example so as you know you get you might work for a global brand and they send you the global assets and you put them in and then you spread them out but it just goes to show they'd purchased for, for one reason which was storytelling and they'd purchased it based on engagement of what it told at the time um, and then if they were just to put that and just go that content works and then put it in a completely different thing which was driving click-throughs to a landing page, that's where it sits. Now, nothing lost here because Lara wasn't putting heaps of money behind each one of those, but we have brands that will purchase five pieces of content and put, you know, 25 grand behind each one. Now, if you're going to be putting 125 grand behind five images, you, you're going to want to pick, um, you're going to want to pick the, the front five rather than the ones at the bottom because the performance comparison was 2.5x. Now, if you apply that to Unilever's $2 billion social media ad spend, you know, you're either getting 2.5 times the performance on your existing campaigns, or you're taking $2 billion down to $800 million. So it's really powerful and interesting to start to look at what happens when you validate content first. And also it starts to surface and it starts to surface these insights because obviously everything was tagged, um, object and facial recognition. And once again, you know, we saw with Sensei yesterday um, with Mark's presentation how unbelievable that the, um, the object and facial recognition and the image tagging is, but we could start to see what performs to be able to draw out other insights that can inform uh, future campaigns. So for instance, we saw that on average, content featuring nachos and burritos, they attracted huge engagement, but they didn't get as many clicks. And then yet content with the highest click-through rates featured people with their meals, seeing a person enjoying it there. But funnily enough, that didn't get a lot of likes. That didn't get a lot of engagement. And then images of the GYG app were among the highest converting. Like that's a powerful insight to be able to draw from a very simple surface level uh, manual test, but you start to see where these can start to drive. And this uh, has changed for us. Sorry to interrupt, Jules, but this for us, and a lot of people in here will understand the nat nature of distinctive assets within your business and kind of that older way of looking at things. This has completely changed the way that we look at our distinctive assets. We're actually doing it with real customers, not research groups that don't really get our brand because they're based in a state where we've got no restaurants. This is actually real data that you guys can use with these guys to change. So all of a sudden our app is now one of our most distinctive assets and, and we leverage the crap out of it because of it. So we're so fortunate to have had access to this data because it's stuff that would never have – and we can move that quickly. You know, it's it's not 1980 anymore. You don't have to go, oh, I'm going to have to change something. You change it that day. Right, cool. Now we're all over the app. Boom. Yeah. And, you know, 
validating your content can be powerful. And obviously, that's what the influencer piece does. Like, you can have 100 pieces of content go out to a live audience, and you can see by engagement which are the top 10. But if you want to dig down, the, the future of this space around UGC, UGC will start to get more and more um, sophisticated, which I think is, uh, is really exciting. But then once you know that the content performs for your exact target audience, there's all these other sort of fun things you can do. So, you know, um, GYG... Uh, Hogarth, which is a global um, uh, strategy or strategic production company, um, and also O Media, we're just trialling and playing around with this idea where you take that content and then you put it into out of home, but it's all based on contextual advertising. So, for instance, um, what we do is we have a store like Bondi Junction and we will invite creators down there to go to Bondi Junction and be clearly at that store, showing Maria, who works behind the desk, showing the setting, and then they submit that content to Hogarth. Hogarth then turns it into amazing stuff with all of these amazing maps, and then that actually goes into all the offices around that particular store. And so if you've got you know, 50 or 60 stores around the country and they're seeing, oh, that's downstairs, reminding them contextual, not only in its location to all of those people around that in lobbies, etc., but also it's contextual because it's they're using content saying grab a breakfast burrito at breakfast time, grab um, nachos for lunch or burritos, or it says on a Friday night, um, go down there and get some margaritas. So do you agree that advertising is not what's necessarily annoying us in life? It's irrelevant advertising. So the Completely. more the more contextual it is, the less offensive it is. Completely. And it's it's amazing. I always talk about, you know, the number of brands that that just have a campaign and don't really think about how they roll those assets out or, or what comes next. And and in this um, context, it's not a threat to creative agencies because it's completely different. Mm. It's actually, it's an add-on, but it's also, um, it's so important the way you think about it. Mm. I like that it gives the control in the brands. Like you can be dragging all this content in and you, you know, you can use Hogarth yeah. there, but your own creators in the Adobe suite can just go absolutely bananas. Yeah. We've got time now to take some questions um, before we wrap up uh, by seeing some of your content. How are we looking there, Lenny? Yep, thumbs up. All right, so does anyone, we've got some roving mics. Does anyone have any questions uh, either for myself or Lara on any of the pieces that we've talked about? Yep, just over here. Thank you. And just let us know your name and where you're from in case it sparks some networking yeah, afterwards for you. Hi, excellent presentation. Really oh, lively and thanks for keeping us totally awake and engaged. Yeah, we're really lunch. drunk. Yeah, so. I know. It works. <laughs> Um, oh, hopefully help. there's some of those drinks up the back, yep. yeah. Yep. So um, my question is, how do you, so obviously I got the sense that a very strong sense of a brand identity is key because that lets you filter which content is in and which is out. But how do you keep that brand identity at scale? So if you have mm. an army of influencers that are producing content, you know, it, and you've got a department of, I don't know, 10 people, whatever it is, yeah. how do you actually scale the selection and the filtration of mm. content so it's on brand and on point and does and dilute into yeah. random stuff like my Instagram feed. So, okay, so it's, <laughs> it's really interesting because I take a very different approach. So when we first started working with Jules, Jules said to me, I don't know about some of this content you're approving, Lyle. Like, it's a bit shit. <laughs> and Cut that. <laughs> <laughs> and no, but this, this is the beauty of knowing who we are. If Mary Jo goes out... And take, there's two things we can control, our food and our experience. But I cannot control what any of you do on your own Instagram feeds. But I love that you do it. Because if you have love for my brand, I fully respect your great and your shit photos <laughs> on Instagram because you're promoting my brand. Like, I'm not saying it's shit, but I'm saying yeah, yeah. overly curated content on Instagram is actually frightening. I don't want content that looks like hashtag ad, hashtag paid, hashtag sponsored post, hashtag ambassador. I don't want that. I actually want authentic, real moments with our food. So our focus is within our own four walls. So operating that at scale, we don't over-curate. We actually 
um, are so grateful to the seven, eight thousand people that go out and take a photo of our food um, that that it's easy for us to make that decision. Sorry to distract you there. I realise I did, um, but Sorry. it's perfect. I mean, that's the, the it's the courage of modern day marketers. You know, you you know your brand isn't what you say it is anymore. It's what your consumers say it is to each other. All you can do is give them the tools and let them know that they're allowed to talk about you. And the more freedom they get, the more they celebrate you, I feel. We've got time for one more question. Yep, over there. Um, um, my name's Alex and I'm from... Um, I was just wondering with the cow campaign, did you have to drop something else to be as reactive as you were to cow? Um, look, from memory, we kind of drop stuff every day. We are so agile okay. and... Um, the answer is we probably likely push things back. Actually, no, I lie. Do you know what? We were launching our 100th restaurant in Burley and that was an enormous celebration. It actually, um, it added to that campaign, mm. so we actually tied it in nicely. Um, but, yeah, we're always dropping and moving because we are agile and we're very um, – you have to be if you live in this space. Yeah. You have to say yes more than you say no. Okay. You know, you have to, you, you've got to let go a little bit and take a bit of a risk and take, take the, you know, the people with you on a journey and say, we've got to start living this and do it. Like, I have a rule. My team have got to be on Insta stories 24-7. Do you know how hard that is? <laughs> we have to have something in your feed. 20, we never come off Insta oh. stories. Oh. That's a lot of content. Yeah. Mm, certainly is. Did anyone else want to ask a quick question before we wrap up? We're all good. All right, what about a big round of applause for Lara Tom? Thank you, Lara. Thank you. Superstar. All right. Thank you, Jules. Thank, Thank you, Jules. Thank you, Lara. <laughs> all right, let's kick into the last bit. All right, I'm just going to skip a couple ahead. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is I just want to invite some people up on stage with a bit of backing music so you feel cool. Uh, ben Webb, where are you, Benny? Ben Webb, big round of applause for Ben Webb. Come on down. Wow, what about Phoebe Bullen? Where's Phoebe? Where's Phoebe Bullen? Come on down, Phoebe. Eh? You can see I miss TV, can't you? All right, Carolyn Heslop, where's Carolyn? Come on, Kaz, from the cheap seats. Awesome. All right, and also Siobhan Hales, where's Siobhan? Good representation. Good on ya, come on down. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. You just jump up at the end there. We might grab a couple of mics if that's all right. I'll get you to jump at the end, Siobhan, or I'll, I'll forget the... Um, the, or the order. So, very simply, we're going to just wrap up, right? There's demand and there's supply. We've established those. Demand, brands need content. Supply, your own customers just take an enormous amount of content. And then we also have the tech enabler, which is the smartphone in itself. And when you start to look at all of those opportunities like the afterpays and the koala mattresses and high smile and um, frank body scrub and all these millennial empires that are building they understand one thing and the reason they're scaring the crap out of the incumbents is because they understand personalization now if we're going to uh, embrace personalization it's going to need an enormous amount of content and that comes from the the fastest growing creative solution on the planet which is you guys and i'll prove that right now so uh, Benny, this is your photo. There we go. So that's your photo, is it? Yeah. Great. Big round of applause. So we're bringing the music down now, Zach. So well, um, who's that small person next to you? Uh, that's my son, Hendrik. Hendrik. So who gave you the socks? Why did you have that photo on your phone? Uh, I just, I had the socks already. I think my wife bought Hendrik the socks and just wore them the same day. So I took the photo. <laughs> and you, you weren't paid for that? No. It looks pretty good there. Credible, doesn't it? I like it. You like it. <laughs> Excellent. Big round of applause. Thank you, Ben. All right. Pass that over to Phoebe. All right, Phoebe, you ready? Could be absolutely anything. Oh, they're cute. We're on the colourful kids scene, aren't we? 
So this gives a bit of an idea. So what was what were you taking these photos for? I won't lie, they're actually adult shoes. What are? Even though they, they look like kids' shoes right there, but they're actually <laughs> a pair of my own shoes. Um, so in the corner there is uh, Gorman's label there. Um, I generally rep Gorman quite a lot, but I think it's quite a unique brand and they're um, someone that I follow regularly. <laughs> I'm stunned. <laughs> Thank you, Phoebe. All right. <laughs> Carolyn. Oh, hashtag adorbs. How perfect's that? So that's in Maui in Victoria by the look of it. No, I'm joking. Where is that? That is in Tuscany. So you're just having the best day. Tell us about the brand experience around that Vespa. What did that mean for you that day? Um, that, that's our family home in Italy. Oh, and, tickets. Um, <laughs> Show we off. Had... We just walked straight into that, didn't we? <laughs> oh, yeah. How many bedrooms? Uh, <laughs> and uh, we crashed it soon after. Good. So you crashed the Vespa? Crashed. Yeah, it was, it was cra captured just before the moment. Amazing. <laughs> All right, big round of applause. Thank you. The reason I show you these is because you guys are the boring side of the marketplace. You know, you're the marketers, but yet look at the content that is sitting idle, billions of photos sitting idle in your phones, all valuable to brands, if only they could access it. All right, last one, Siobhan, this is yours. Oh, we know where that is. Somewhere very nice in Bali. Yeah. It was actually the last day of my holiday, so we're having cocktails. Beautiful. Sunset, so why not take a photo, really? What's extraordinary is, and Apple as well seemed to got a, a get a free plug there, but what's extraordinary is um, that we, it's not brands, like we love brands. In fact, we don't just like brands, we love brands. Our favourite brands, we all endorse a thousand as consumers. Like for me, it's Ben and Jerry's or it's my Corona on a Friday. You know, like for me, celebrating those brands comes naturally. In the commercial world, it's advertising that usually gives us the shits and irrelevant advertising. But how we express our love for brands is really, really unique. And you see the fact that that sits inadvertently as us celebrating those things every day. So as marketers, it's really just about unlocking that creativity. Big round of applause for these four. Thank you, guys. You get no prizes except the acknowledgement from your peers. Um, all right, we have some time to wrap up now, but I just want to thank everyone for your, um, your participation. Big thanks, of course, to Lara Tom. Um, thank you to Adobe as well for the opportunity to be able to talk about something that we all are very passionate about and to be able to share a story of what I believe is, is the fastest growing creative solution, which is you guys, um, the other side of the marketplace that can relieve great pain points, the UGC. Thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate it.